Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. This one, I'm going to be just giving a, a quick report on disturbing trends both in the educational sphere and the financial sector. Specifically, I'm going to just walk through very quickly some key excerpts from an article that was tweeted out by the National Education Association. All right, so this isn't just some fringe radical thought piece that you know you had to scour the bowels of HuffPo to find. This is something that the NEA from their official Twitter account linked to uh, recently. And I just think some of you might be surprised by what it says, by how open and radical it is. And then also, just in case you good folks have all been occupied by the lockdowns and the concerns over the virus and the battles over the medical science and so on, and the election, uh, you may not have realized what the Fed has been up to. And so I'm going to talk about that as well. For those of you who are listening to this on the audio version, um, it's, you'll still get something out of it, but especially for the stuff I do with the Fed, I'm going to be pointing to some charts. So there you might want to dig up the YouTube version of this and you go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 150 to see the links for that. So let me just give credit where credit is due. Uh, this tweet that the NEA sent out, I'm just riffing off here um, from uh, Carolyn Borisenko. She's a, a, a YouTuber of rising prominence lately, getting into all the gender politics and identity politics stuff. And so she had a whole episode on this. So, of course, I'll link to her episode uh, in, the, in my show notes page. But I'm just amplifying it because the stuff she found here is is pretty incredible. So, again, what this is, as you can see, if you're following along on the YouTube version of this, it's an NEA link. And so here's what the NEA's tweet says. What anti-racism really means for educators. Anti-racist work in all schools is essential. It is the exercise of hope, the practice of undoing and dismantling systems of oppression, the practice of freedom and of truth-telling. And then it gives a link to this article, and that's what I'm going to be reading from. So the title of this article and the, the website is at tolerance.org. And if you've been paying attention, <laughs> you know what that means is that this website is devoted to anything but actual tolerance. And the title is What Anti-Racism Really Means for Educators. Uh, the author is Jam Jamalia Pitts. And this ran on September 11th, 2020. So I'll go through and just read some of this. Because, uh, again, this the point of this largely speaks for itself. But I think some of you may be surprised at, at where they go with this. So it starts out. Anti-racist work in all schools is essential. It is the exercise of hope, the practice of undoing and dismantling systems of oppression, the practice of freedom and of truth-telling. Anti-racist work is the practice of healing and of restoring. It is a practice of love could be against any of this stuff. This is great. We live in a time where it is increasingly clear that black lives are deeply undervalued and violently treated. And as the words anti-racist and equity become dangerously trendy, educators should pause and grapple with what they truly mean. It is important that we have a shared understanding of what anti-racism in schools looks like, that we have an understanding of what it is not, and that we embrace the understanding that anti-racist work is never completely finished, nor does it always look the same. All right, so that's kind of open-ended right there, just to repeat that one, that we embrace the understanding that anti-racist work is never completely finished, nor does it always look the same. All right, so for one thing, she's establishing we're doing this forever, and also just because we're going to do a certain set of practices for the next five years, don't think that's it. We reserve the right to always change what anti-racism entails. I mean, this is like, you know, the right's war on terror. Like, okay, that's, that's a blank check to be doing whatever you want around the world forever. I hope, however, we may begin to think about anti-racist work in schools in ways that are holistic and practical. Okay, so this next part here I'll go through quickly because this is just creepy. So this section is titled, Anti-Racist Educators Believe in Love. Many educators operate from the premise that they love their students. In fact, many harmful and violent teachers operate from a place of love. But anti-racist educators understand that love and silence are deeply contradictory. The love that underpins our practice is not the form of love often associated with passivity and inaction. For anti-racist educators, love is action. Love is sharp. Love is truth-telling. Love is fighting for what is right. Love is doing what is right. 
Anti-racist educators, particularly those who teach black students, understand that part of the act of love is understanding what this country has intentionally done and continues to do to black bodies. Right? Not to black students, to black bodies. It is love that compels our practices. Anti-racist educators understand that, in love, they must never be silent. Ever. Anti-racist educators understand that their positions as teachers, leaders, policymakers, and social workers are positions of great privilege and power, and that they have the ability to leave this world better than they found it. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to go ahead and start skipping through because I want you to see... Here's a good, good paragraph. Anti-racist educators know and continue to seek out the names of those who are never called upon and the work that is hardly ever revered. They recognize that we should study more deeply the tactics of the Black Panther Party and the Freedom Schools. Dr. Goldie Muhammad is a true leader and scholar warrior in this regard as her work focuses on the ways the black literary societies of the early 1800s operated and creates a framework for how we should be using the power of literacy to teach and empower black students. Anti-racist educators believe in the intellectual power of teaching. They believe they have to honor the practice and take teaching very, very seriously because they know and understand how schools have been used either to oppress or to liberate. So again, just to remind you, this is not some obscure thing that I had to go looking for in order to discredit you know, a very sensible mainstream movement. The NEA was linking to this article. And which is openly calling for emulating the tactics of the Black Panther Party. Okay, so here's another thing. In case you're wondering, like, okay, Bob, you're probably exaggerating. The, I'm sure the scope of this is just a little tweaking on the margins. No, no. Anti-racist educators recognize that schools, you know, right now, are doing exactly what they were built to do in this country. Let me just make sure you hear what this is again. Anti-racist educators recognize that schools are doing exactly what they were built to do in this country. Exclude, silence, erase, promote white supremacy. They recognize, therefore, that upending racism in schools will end schooling practices as we have come to know them. Right? So, again, don't kid yourself. This isn't, hey, you know, let's go ahead and emphasize George Washington Carver, and let's not just focus on dead white presidents in the curriculum. Let's bring in some more contributions from African American. No, no, no. There's, she's saying the function of schools historically was to exclude, silence, erase, and promote white supremacy. So if that's where you're coming from, obviously you don't just tinker with that, right? It's not like, oh, why don't we get the right people running the KKK? No, you got to dismantle it. So if the school system as such by design, was to promote white supremacy, which she's openly saying here, well, then it follows quite naturally. Well, the way you get rid of that insidious practice is you completely uh, revamp what schooling is. And again, I'm not putting words in her mouth. She says, we'll end schooling practices as we have come to know them. To think about all, part, all, the, all of the parts of schooling and not just the classroom, anti-racist educators take a holistic approach and consider many dimensions of schooling through an anti-racist, anti-oppressive lens. These dimensions include the demographics of staff, particularly in schools with predominantly BIPOC students, so B-I-P-O-C, uh, school leadership and past to school leadership, school governance, school curriculum, special education, teaching and learning practices, definitions and measurements of academic success, definitions and measurements of teacher success, professional development, new teacher training and support, the wellness of teachers, school mission, school network and district policies, school culture and approaches to discipline, school infrastructure, allocations of resources and budget. Okay, so I went through that pretty quickly, but that's ticking off. Like the demographics of staff with the first bullet point means, of course, you know, quotas in, in terms of who's, who's hired based on their skin color and the stuff about definitions and measurements of academic success what that means is, you know, oh, it, you're not going to apply and say, like, do the kids know how to do trigonometry by the time they graduate? Do they know how to read and write an essay? That, no, because if there's disparate outcomes, then that's obviously racist measures, and therefore those don't count. Again, just to repeat it, she said, comes back to anti-racist educators understand that an anti-racist approach to schooling could very well mean an ending to schools as we know them. All right. And then ending again with a section titled anti-racism is healing and love in action. And the final paragraph is nice. 
the ways that we as educators must care for ourselves and create educational spaces that center healing our students' bodies is crucial. This, let me read that again. You probably think I skipped a preposition. No, I didn't. This is the way the sentence is written. And this also, this language comes from her bio. So this is not just a typo. The ways that we as educators must care for ourselves and create educational spaces that center healing our students' bodies is crucial. We must create educational spaces that tend to the harm and violence that has been enacted against BIPOC bodies and minds, specifically those of our children. Anti-racist educators recognize that this is the work of undoing, of dismantling, of liberating, of healing, and of truth-telling. This is our collective work. Okay, so again, this is not something you got to read between the lines, openly calling for emulating the practices of the Black Panthers and specifically undoing, dismantling, and liberating healing and truth-telling when it comes to the current school structure, which was by design implemented in order to further white supremacy. And <laughs> again, this is not that I went looking for something outrageous to get clicks. This is something that the NEA was linking to. Now, um, Carolyn, she her theory was not that the NIA, NEA has totally bought into this because they're true believers, but she thought it was more like how businesses in certain areas, you know, put up BLM signs like, hey, please don't attack us. We're, we're with you guys, right? Right. We're totally on board. Please leave us alone. So she thinks the NEA is, is doing that. It's institutional uh, decision was that we're going to try to on the surface be allies with these revolutionaries. So maybe they'll, you know, not insist that all of our existing personnel get fired or something. Right. So, she, so her interpretation of why did the NEA link to this is not because it was full throated support, but because they were afraid. So, you know, I, did, I can't speak to that. I don't know one way or the other, but it's plausible theory. But in any event, it is significant that that's what is now, you know, the mainstream discourse, that that's with where the conversation is, is starting. And now let, let's discuss. What do you think? We've got this viewpoint saying we should uh, the existing school structure is um, purposely put in place to further white supremacy. And so we should um, dismantle it and study the Black Panther Party to see how we might go about doing that. And it's all coming from a place of love. Who wants to respond to that? Right. That, that's where we're, the conversation is now being centered, to use her phrase. OK, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the Federal Reserve and the news hook, as it were, is Joe Jorgensen recently. It's <laughs> it's I actually I think I literally laughed out loud when I saw it, because for those of you who don't know, the, the libertarian candidate for president, whoever's run her Twitter account and we're giving her the benefit of the doubt that it's not her, has been doing stuff that's many libertarians with a small L think is, is tone deaf. For example, there's plenty of areas where standard libertarian party positions would, in my opinion, really help end certain injustices or greatly reduce injustices that tend to plague the black community more than others, like, you know, police brutality, terrible inner city schools, uh, high unemployment rates, things like that. So instead of just saying, oh, yeah, that's all due to systemic racism, you could say, well, no, there's actually certain institutional policies that the government has in place, things like the drug war, um, qualified immunity for police. Uh, public schools are terrible especially in poor neighborhoods. And so the solution there to me is not, oh, we need more resources and we need to revamp the thinking. The solution is to take it out of the political sphere. Um, th things, uh, the minimum wage policies, in my opinion, devastate poor communities, especially with uh, kids who don't have a lot of job skills because they can't get that first job to start climbing the ladder. So standard libertarian policies would do a lot to help the black community and, Joe Jorgensen's campaign to try to ride the coattails of BLM started, you know, just actively embracing BLM, even with hashtags and stuff. So a lot of libertarians were upset saying, you know, that that's an actively Marxist organization, right? And, you know, couldn't you have tried to reach out to disaffected voters and, and get them to go third party without explicitly endorsing BLM? And, you know, okay, so that was the controversy and people, some were like, oh, come on, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Fair enough. And so some libertarians were saying, well, you know, why don't you, you know, I'd, I'd like it if they would talk about the Fed. You know, that's a big thing. And so finally, the campaign did, you know, coming from her official Twitter account, she did recently tweet about the Fed. 
but the thing she led with was to say the Federal Reserve is a private organization. You know, like like that that's the number one thing that's wrong with it. And so, of course, a lot of free market libertarians were rolling their eyes like, geez, you can't get anything right, can you? Even when you're going to complain about the Fed, you got to lead with, hey, did you know that this is a private organization? Okay, so I want to just clarify, you know, that the nature of the Fed. So it is true, and uh, for whatever reason, for some people, this fact is the thing that really wakes them up and they get outraged. Like, what? Are you kidding me? I had no idea. So the Federal Reserve, it is true, it is literally owned by bankers or, or technically by, by banks, I think is the legal structure. And then, you know, who owns the banks? Okay. So the federal reserve actually has shareholders and the federal reserve pays dividends on a regular schedule to its owners who are other banks. All right. So that is a weird arrangement, right? So the federal reserve is not because the federal reserve right now is tasked with regulating the banks. Okay, so it would be as if like the FDA, which is in charge of regulating the pharmaceutical companies. Imagine if the FDA had shareholders who just so happened to be pharmaceutical companies and that the FDA paid dividends to the pharmaceutical companies every, you know, periodically. That would be kind of weird, wouldn't it? All right, and so that is true. And so if that surprises you, okay, (laughs) you should know that. Um, However, it's it's not quite right to just say, oh, it's a private entity. I think the best you could say is it's quasi private because all of the, you know, the board of governors, the the ruling body of the federal reserve that sets its policies, they're selected. They're the president nominates them and the Senate has to confirm them. Okay. So there is a thing in terms of the overall structure um, where some get sent from the, the member banks on the broader committee to make monetary policy, but in terms of the, you know, the power structure, and in particular, the chair of the Federal Reserve and the vice chair are nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate, all right? So, you know, suppose you had Walmart and his own privately or, you know, some other thing that has publicly traded things. And imagine, though, that the CEO and the other vice presidents of the company are all appointed by the president of the United States and confirmed by the Senate, right? That would be a weird sort of thing that, you know, the shareholders, yes, are sitting back and getting dividend payments, but they're not directly in charge of the policies of the company that they ostensibly own if the, you know, the CEO and the and the board of directors are chosen by, or the, or the vice presidents, whatever I said, are chosen not by them, not by the owners, but by the political apparatus in, in, in Washington. All right, so that's how the Federal Reserve works. So it, it makes sense if you think about it, that I think historically when central banks emer- you know, were created and then you know, maintained and evolved over time, it was a convenient symbiotic relationship between like, you know, the king wants to go to war. He wants somebody to pay for it. Just going out in the open market and borrowing money from rich capitalists isn't going to cut it. And so he gives special privileges to one particular bank you know, giving it privileges over relative to other banks, allowing it to do things like issue notes and so forth and suspend its uh, redemption on its on its outstanding notes in terms of gold, stuff like that, giving special privileges to this one bank, calling it the central bank. But in exchange for, OK, when I want to go to war, you're going to finance my debt. All right. And so I think that explains the symbiotic relationship that the bank's the bankers that get so anointed and get special status like that. But the reason the government's happy to grant that to somebody is because then the bank from its newfound position uh, being elevated above others and the standard rules of contract then uh, is going to lend money to the government. All right. To help finance a war typically. So I think that same pattern is true of the United States, the federal reserve, you know, coming in late 1913, very soon after its creation, helped finance the U.S.'s um, entry into World War One. You can just see, like, the Fed's balance sheet, you know, explodes during World War One and then during World War Two. So that's that's the story as far as historically. So what I want to just end with on today's episode here is just to explain, make sure you're aware. So for those on the YouTube, you're looking at this is a plot of the Federal Reserve's total assets or its balance sheet, if you're familiar with that kind of terminology. So this is just measuring 
the dollar value of all the assets that the Federal Reserve System itself owns, right? So just to be clear, this isn't looking at like all the banks in the United States. It's not saying the jurisdiction over which the Fed has authority. It's saying, no, the Federal Reserve banks themselves, okay? And this is what they own. And so you can see in this chart, um, you know, 2004, 2005, 2006, it was in near a trillion dollars because this axis here is, a mi is millions and so million, millions, a trillion, um, but not quite there. And so it was around like 850 billion or so in the summer of 2008. Then going into the fall of 2008, remember when the financial crisis hit and then you see it, it jumps up. OK, so specifically uh, mid like early. Early September 2008, there was about 900 billion in total assets, and then by late November, there was 2.1 trillion. Okay, so more than doubling their assets in just uh, two months, basically. And that was right again when the financial crisis hit. If you remember, Hank Paulson getting down on his knee and begging Nancy Pelosi for TARP funds and so on. Okay, and then. This right here, if you're following me on, on YouTube, there this one in the mid, let's see, around, when is this, 2010 up through late 2011 was what was called QE2. And then the next hump is what was called QE3, quantitative easing round three. And then it was flat for a while, all from you know 2014 up through... 2018, it was pretty flat that the Fed was just rolling over its assets. As they, the Fed owns a lot of bonds. As they matured. It was just going out and buying new ones. And then it even allowed it to start rolling off. Right from late 2017 all the way down until actually the fall of 2019, the Fed was letting on net, you know, so assets would mature. So the bonds in the Fed's balance sheet would be paid off. And then the Fed would go out and buy more new bonds, but not as many in terms of dollars as had been paid off. And so the Fed's assets were shrinking in this period. But then last fall, there was the liquidity crunch, the repo crisis, and the Fed came in and started injecting stuff. And so you see it's a little, little blip, but then this humongous jump occurred. All right. So just to give quantitatively for those who are listening. So as of March 4th, 2020, the Fed held... 4.2 trillion dollars in assets. Then by June 10th, 2020, right? So from early March to June, so April, May, June, so that's just three months, the Fed held about 7.2 trillion in assets. Right? So it bought three trillion dollars worth of assets in three months. And that was right when, you know, the coronavirus panic really kicked into high gear. And the Fed was doing all sorts of other stuff, too. Like, for example, I remember they had this emergency unscheduled meeting that happened on a Sunday. And Powell gets up there and makes an announcement. And if you clicked on the, you know, the minutes of the meeting and then there was like a footnote with a link to some other thing. And then you click that. And at the very end of that second document, it mentioned that, oh, yeah, by the way, we're getting rid of reserve requirements for banks. Right? It was just a <laughs> Sunday night announcement. They didn't even I don't even think Powell mentioned it, you know, in his oral remarks. And like I say, it wasn't even in the main press release. You had to click a link to some subsidiary thing that at the tail end of that, it explained, oh, yeah, we're getting rid of reserve requirements. All right. So lots of stuff going on there. I'm not going to elaborate it on in this particular episode, but the types of assets that the Fed is allowed to buy, that has been greatly. Exp well, it's not that it's been. It's not that the, the, the permission has been granted. I'm saying in practice what the Fed has gone out and started buying it's not just the quantitative that it did $3 trillion in three months. And by the way, just to, for those looking at the YouTube, you can see the disparity. But what the Fed has done since the coronavirus panic started is about triple, in absolute dollar terms, what it did in the immediate wake of the financial crisis. All right, so some of you may remember guys like Glenn Beck had charts of what the Fed was doing back in the fall of 2008. And he was, you know, getting on like a forklift on his show. And so the camera would pull way back and Glenn would be driving along the chart and then have the forklift lift him up to show you, look at this spike, look at how much the Fed's pumped in. So what the Fed has done, you know, you know since uh, 
March through June of 2020 is triple what the Fed did again in response to uh, the fall of Lehman. All right. But my point is, it's not just a quantitative increase. It's not just the Fed's creating more dollars, but the types of assets that it's buying are are qualitatively different as well. That the Fed is expanding the types of things that it's allowed to, even buying like debt issued by corporations, which you know would have been inconceivable in 2005, let's say. All right, because it, let me just end by explaining in case you've never heard this spelled out before. So what does it mean when the, when the Fed goes and buys assets? And this is partly why I think the Jorgensen campaign was stressing the private aspect of it because the Fed has certain powers that really are amazing. And, uh, you know, this is, it's, some might liken it to alchemy, but alchemy is actually honest, right? <laughs> so I'll, I'll link in the show notes page that uh, my wife and I have been watching some things lately where, you know, you may never have heard this, like Isaac Newton was into alchemy. There have actually been experiments in the 20th century where physicists took baser metals and transformed it into gold, right? So that's, uh, there was one in like 1941, but I think all the, they took, they took mercury and turned it into gold, but all that gold was radioactive. And then in 1980, like they did it for real where they turned some base metal or base, you know, structure into gold that was not radioactive, right? So, so they actually did it. Now it was ludicrously expensive, right? So that, that wouldn't be a, a surefire way of producing gold um, more cheaply than you could get it from a mine. So that's why gold is still valuable right now. But I'm saying that the procedure was there, right? And even the ancient alchemists, they did think that, you know, you're going to turn mercury into gold. So they were onto something. They just didn't have the technology to, to pull it off, or at least um, a lot of them didn't, right? So, so that stuff, you know, someone might say, oh, what the Fed's doing is alchemy, but that's not fair to the alchemist. At least the alchemist in principle could turn something physically into gold, in which case it would really be gold. Whereas what the Fed does is just by the act of buying assets creates the money with which it bought them. All right. And, and this, by the way, I don't want to get, go too far afield here. This isn't unique to central banks. The legal structure, the way commercial banking works nowadays even regular commercial banks, there's a sense in which they can do this too. All right. But with the Fed, it's they're allowed to create legal tender dollars, whereas commercial banks don't quite have that full legal power. Okay. So um, what the Fed does, like I said, it's bought $3 trillion of assets over three months since the coronavirus panic hit. So what does that mean? Does that mean that the Fed had $3 trillion somewhere in a checking account? and withdrew it to go buy assets? Or, or did the Fed have to go do a bunch of consulting services to earn the income to then go buy it? Or did it sell off some real estate that it held somewhere to raise the money? No. When the Fed goes into the marketplace, it sees you know some bonds it wants to buy, some issued by the federal government or whoever, mortgage-backed securities, whatnot. Let's say there's a billion dollars of assets that the Fed wants to buy. So it electronically writes a check gives it to the seller, the seller takes it and deposits it in his bank account. And now that bank, let's say it's Citibank, you know, it has an account itself with the Fed. And so the Fed just credits Citibank's account and just bumps up its assets by a million dollars or by a billion dollars, right? So the, what Citibank has on deposit with the Fed, that number in the spreadsheet or, you know, in the computer system increases by a billion dollars. There's no billion dollar debit anywhere, right? It's not that the Federal Reserve has a finite amount of money and then subtracts it every time it gives money to somebody else. No, just the mere act of the Fed writing a check and buying something has increased the number of dollars in the system. All right, and so that's, I guess, you know, that, that's an extraordinary power and for some people, they would think if the government's going to give that power to an institution, surely it would be a branch of the government itself where it could, there could be oversight. And that's technically giving it to the, the Federal Reserve, which, like I say, for some people, when they find out it's technically privately owned, that disturbs them. So to my mind, I would say, no, the problem here is 
granting that power to an institution, whether it's run by Nancy Pelosi and uh, you know Mitch McConnell and, and the rest of the gang in Washington, or whether it's run by Jay Powell and other people, to me is largely irrelevant. The issue is, why does somebody have that power? Why does some institution have that power in the first place? But that's the power nonetheless. And like I say, well, the country has been squabbling, rightfully so, over you know lockdowns and uh, cities getting set on fire and things like this. The Fed has somewhat quietly moved in and done that. And I'm going to just go out on a limb and say what's going to end up happening is there's going to be you know, more economic turmoil. More people are going to go, whether there's an outright explicit crash, which I do think is coming, but even if it's not that, if it's just a slow burn, you know, as these lockdowns, even in their, their reduced form, continue to cause more people, you know, to default, more businesses to go under, assets are going to fall in value, and the people that are politically connected have access to this pipeline of trillions of dollars that the Fed can create just through keystrokes, and they're quietly buying up stuff. So you've got <laughs> radical activists taking over dismantling the school system, and then in the terms of the financial sector, complete upheaval with a lot of middle-class business owners getting wiped out and people who are you know, well-to-do or quite rich, in fact, and connected to political power coming in with Fed money and, and buying up assets. So there you go. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thanks for your attention, and I'll see you next time. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit BobMurphyShow.com. <laughs>